Good morning, everybody. Uh, well, in, in Washington, this is already noon, but uh, I'm, I'm now in Mexico City, not in San Diego. So my name is Rafael Fernandez de Castro. I'm the director of the Center for US-Mexican Studies at UC San Diego. And, and I welcome you all to this webinar about, I mean, what is the role of Mexico in the US presidential campaign 2024? We're lucky to have uh, such a wonderful panelist, uh, Sergio Alcocer, this is organized by the Consejo Mexicano de Asuntos Internacionales, COMEXI, and by the Center of U.S.-Mexican Studies at UCSD. And uh, so I will give the floor to Sergio Alcocer to introduce the panelists. Sergio, yours is the floor. Just before I give the floor to Sergio, let me remind you, everybody, that uh, we want this to be very interactive. So we have a, a Q and A button uh, there. Please use it, send the questions uh, to our panelists, and, and they will be ready to answer it to you. Sergio Alcocer, please. Muchas gracias, Rafael. Pues muy buenos días y muy buenas tardes hasta Washington. Eh, para mí es un placer poder presentar a nuestros panelistas. Muchísimas gracias por acompañarnos. Catherine Brun, quien es, es, se especializa en el estudio de política comparada, identidad de estudios latinoamericanos en la Universidad de California, en el plantel de Santa Bárbara. Sus líneas de investigación eh, incluyen la democratización por partidos políticos y la movilización social. Su último libro se, denomina, se titula en español Política y la, eh, pues, digamos, Marea Rosa, eh, que viene, se va a publicar próximamente en University of Notre Dame Press, examina cómo las políticas económicas y las estructuras de los partidos políticos afectan la, las protestas o las manifestaciones, así como también eh, las políticas alrededor de las manifestaciones en cinco países de América Latina. Ella ha publicado de manera muy eh, amplia acerca de las elecciones en nuestro país, las campañas, los efectos de las eh, primarias de los diversos partidos políticos, así como de la izquierda mexicana. Catherine, muy bienvenida, muchas gracias por acompañarnos. Me da mucho gusto también dar la bienvenida a María Echaveste, una destacada académica de la Universidad de California, en el plantel, en este caso, de Berkeley. Ella actualmente es la presidenta del Instituto de las Oportunidades, Opportunity Institute, en donde encabeza las diversas actividades de liderazgo dentro del instituto. Ella ha tenido una actividad muy amplia, como mencionaba, en la Universidad de California, en Berkeley, en el ámbito de la Escuela de Leyes, eh, como también en el Instituto de, de la propia Universidad acerca de Seguridad Alimentaria. Tuvo la oportunidad de trabajar en la administración del presidente Clinton, directamente encargada de la operación de la Casa Blanca, y además con una, eh, una señalada participación en la política del gobierno estadounidense hacia, los, hacia México y hacia América Latina. Eh, actualmente ella eh, tiene diversas eh, eh, actividades en la Universidad de California de San Francisco como miembro de la junta directiva de uno de los hospitales. Ella estudió antropología en la Universidad de Stanford y, y, y posteriormente obtuvo un doctorado en leyes en la Universidad de California en Berkeley. Y nuestro tercer invitado es eh, el ex embajador de los Estados Unidos en México, el embajador Christopher Landau, quien también es abogado. Eh, él estudió leyes en la Universidad de Harvard. Eh, posteriormente trabajó en varias repetidas ocasiones, un par de ocasiones en la Suprema Corte, eh, dentro del de grupo de juristas que apoyaron en su momento al ministro eh, Antonio Escalia, Escalia, así como también al ministro eh, um, um, eh, Clarence eh, Thomas. Actualmente él es abogado en la firma Ellis George en la ciudad de Washington DC y como mencioné, fue el embajador de los Estados Unidos en México entre el año 2019 y 2021, con una actividad muy amplia, muy reconocida por todos en México, muy particularmente su participación en las redes sociales, que creo que abrió un hito en, en, en nuestro país de los embajadores eh, haciendo referencia a sus diversas actividades en las redes sociales. Embajador Orlando, muy bienvenido. Pues muy bienvenidos, Carmen, Mary, María y Christopher. Y adelante, Rafael. Thank you, Sergio. Uh, I, uh, wonderful to have you, and uh, I believe to have an academic and, and to have uh, uh, two uh, former diplomat, a uh, 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 former policymaker is wonderful. I believe we have a good balance here. And uh, 
For all purposes, uh, Chris, uh, Maria, and Kate, I believe that, I mean, the primary season is over. Uh, we, ha we have two candidates, and uh, we have Super Tuesday last Tuesday, and, uh, and, 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 uh, and Donald Trump did very well, as well as Biden. And yesterday, we listened to this State of the Union, and it was clearly, I mean, the, the, the beginning of a, of a presidential campaign. So let me start with you, Chris. What is your take on this? We're going to see, we're seeing a rematch of 2020. How do you feel about it? And uh, what are the things that we want to, to be looking at? And uh, so let's talk about first about US politics, and then we'll talk about, because the mission of this webinar is to talk about Mexico and the US-Mexican issues within the campaign. But let's start about politics, about the moment we're living right now. And thank you, Chris, again, for being with us. Please go thank ahead. Thank you. It's, it's my pleasure, Rafael. Thank you for the introduction to you and to Sergio, and thanks to both to Comexi and the uh, the Center for uh, U.S.-Mexico Relations at UCSD. It's just a pleasure to be back with uh, with old friends again and to talk about these issues that are really so important in both countries. Let me just say, in terms of the U.S. election, I think what's really extraordinary here is that we're going to have two incumbent presidents running against each other for the first time in more than 100 years since Theodore Roosevelt uh, tried to run for uh, re-election uh, in 1912 uh, uh, to su uh, succeed the, the the man that he had handpicked for president uh, in 1908, uh, President Taft, uh, and then Woodrow Wilson, of course, won that election. But you know, here uh, we're going to have two uh, past presidents with records as president. I mean, typically when you have an incumbent and a challenger, you know, the challenger is promising all kinds of stuff that 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 that, that uh, he's going to do differently. Uh, here, both of them have a record of four years as president, and the American people can look at those records and compare. And so I think it's going to be a very different campaign than we are used to. Uh, you know, I think a lot of people, um, you know, are, are a little bit surprised that we wound up in this place, uh, given that there are high negatives for both candidates, but we had, as you just said, Rafael, a, 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 a primary season that at least on the Republican side was very vigorous. And, you know, a whole variety of, of, of a menu of different choices of, of different kinds of candidates. And Donald Trump clearly uh, came out on top of that. There was really nothing ambiguous about that. So, you know, I think another, just as a final point, uh, point that we shouldn't lose sight of, even though the two main candidates are set, I still think one wild card remains the third party uh, issue, and I think it could be significant in this election. I, I don't know that, but you know, obviously, uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is running as an independent, and you know, we may see other uh, third party candidates in this election. So, I, I honestly predict this is going to be a wild ride of a year, and anybody who says that they know how it's all going to end <laughs> up uh, is smoking something that they're not supposed to be. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Yeah, anything were predictable. Yeah. Beautiful. Maria, let's go with you. I mean, you've been in presidential campaigns. You were very close to Hillary. And uh, I remember vividly that uh, at a time you were working for the Hillary campaign and your husband was working for Obama's campaign. That was uh, very telling in your family. Uh, so, Maria, give us your sense, your take on this. Uh, I mean, how you see this rematch, uh, Biden Trump? Well, I think that the three points I would make is that it's a rematch that for a great number of people do not want, did not want. And uh, it's unfortunate. I find myself in various settings getting people coming up to me. Look, why, why, why? And uh, why did Biden run? And why do we have to do this again? And I keep saying it that Biden has worked his entire life to be president. And he succeeded in that close election in 2020. And he has a track record. Um, and the fact is that his State of the Union yesterday showed a level of energy that many of us were hoping to see. So no one really gives up power and he's got a lot to do. And he really believes that he's the one who can take on uh, former President Trump. So. We have a rematch that a lot of people didn't want. Number two, what's more really going to get played out, I think, is that difference in vision for the country. Um, 
uh, an optimistic view about where this country is going versus, I would say, um, pres former President Trump's um, darker vision. And that's going to get played out. And um, I would say one of the things that I've learned uh, from working with President Clinton was that elections are about the future. They're about the future. And who is able to describe a future that more people will want to invest in? That's going to be the trick. And obviously, I have a particular view. But the third thing is, this election is not happening and never happens in a vacuum. And we cannot ignore the both the war in Ukraine, the Middle East, and the impact that Gaza will have on a part of the coalition that brought uh, Biden to the White House. And that, I really feel, has to be paid close attention um, because Michigan will be in play, but young people across, uh, young Latinos, are very pro-Palestinian. Uh, pro so this is going to be tricky. So yes, this election is about the United States and its future, but you cannot ignore um, the external, the foreign, and obviously immigration, Mexico, this is why we're here today, is hugely relevant as well. Thank you, Maria. Uh Kate, uh, what is your take on this? Uh, you're one of the academics in the U.S. who has uh, been very attentive uh, to Mexico and Mexican affairs. So if you give us a sense of uh, I mean, how you feel about this rematch, but also if you, if you would like to start introducing the topic, I mean, how you feel that Mexico role would be in this campaign. And let me remind everybody, let's recuerdo a todo mundo, that there's a Q&A button, hay un botón ahí de preguntas y respuestas. Envíenos sus respuestas, please send us your questions, uh, your comments, because we want to do this uh, webinar as interactive as possible. Kate, please, yours is the floor, and I will give the floor to Sergio. Well, I wanted to start with a couple of points about the, um, the, the U.S. election and then talk about start to talk about Mexico's role in it, one of which is that while... They these are presidents who both have records. Um, the memories of Trump are older than the memories of Biden. And so in many ways, I think it still is an election about the incumbent's record um, and not about what people remember of Trump. I think those memories may have faded a little bit. Um, his absence from Twitter may have caused people to not pay as much attention outside of his base. Uh, and so when we talk about issues like immigration, I'm not sure to what extent people actually remember the separation of families at the border, uh, to what degree they remember the Muslim ban, to what degree they remember um, the uh, the other, uh, the building of the wall, uh, the attempts to build the wall. Um, it's a very big talking point on the Republican side, um, but I'm not sure to what degree independents really have uh, incorporated that in their memories. Um, I, I remain surprised that despite all of the president, President Trump's legal difficulties, uh, he remains as popular or more popular than ever. In fact, the beginning of his legal difficulties was also the beginning of his surge in the polls. Um, so it, it does strike me that we can't ignore uh, what's going on with those cases. I personally doubt that they will be resolved before the election, um, but uh, there are ongoing events that bring him to mind as a victim. Uh, and I think that that is part of the current support for him uh, that's, that he is perceived to be this victim. And lastly, I want to talk about the Latino vote. Um, this has been an increasingly important part of uh, coalitions, in, particularly in the border states. And it is not clear to me that the Latino vote is really not anymore a, um, a guarantee for either side. I think it is really very much up for grabs uh, and that the con conduct of the election will determine where the Latino vote is going to come down. It doesn't matter in states perhaps like California, it doesn't matter in maybe very much in states like Texas, but it will matter in states like Arizona. 
Uh, it will matter uh, in states like New Mexico. Uh, so uh, I think that uh, that Maria is right, that the Mexico related issues are not uh, the only force that's going to determine the outcome of this election, um, but they are, I think, a significant part of it. And so that's why we're here today. Thank you, Kate. Uh, uh, already Pablo Cervantes asked us a question, but please, again, uh, we're waiting for your questions. Uh, Sergio Al Alcocer, the floor is yours. What, what would you ask our, our panelists about Mexico or whatever you want to ask? Well, I think what Pablo is asking an interesting question, and then we can move to Mexico, is what would be the role of the influence of China in, in this uh, election? Because there are similar uh, positions from both candidates, but with subtle differences. So what, what do you think would be the role of China? Not role of, not China itself, but the topic of China in the, in the election. I, let me jump in and I'd love to hear what, what the ambassador and Kate have to say, but I think, um, I think for Biden and what he will be stressing will be the way in which his policies, the uh, investment, um, chip manufacturing, those as a way of um, talking about China, but about bringing manufacturing jobs back. So it's, it's a, in caught up in the economy and, and a manufacturing policy, I think probably will be the direction and have the most relevance to uh, those uh, voters who care about China. They're probably caring about it in terms of jobs, I, but I'd be curious, I did. Yeah, just, you, Chris? yeah, just to follow up on that. I mean, I think one of President Trump's great accomplishments is that he was really the first one to blow the whistle on China. The, our foreign policy establishment in the United States had long labored under the view that, well, as China develops economically, they will uh, their, their political system will reform and we'll all be be friends. I think it became very clear over the years, but the, our foreign policy establishment was very slow to recognize this, that that was not the way things were going. And I actually think that uh, President Trump's, uh, you know, uh, tough policies on China one are, are probably the single most important policy that he announced that Biden did not attempt to reverse. And I think there is a pretty broad consensus now across American politics that China is an important strategic competitor uh, and that that competition uh, encompasses the whole globe. Obviously, that has a particular relevance for the U.S.-Mexico relationship, uh, which was highlighted during the pandemic that, you know, we have so many supply chains that are now in China. And I think hopefully we can all agree that that is not a a, a positive or helpful situation for the United States. And, uh, you know, I think it's great if jobs come back to the United States. That's that's the best. But I think there's a lot of opportunities for Mexico to have jobs come back there. You know, when I was ambassador, people talked a lot about nearshoring, friendshoring, but frankly, I was frustrated that not more was actually happening. Uh, I think I, I've just been in Mexico recently. I think there's a lot more happening there. I think that's very positive for both the United States and Mexico. And so I think that's it. I'd like to see that trend, frankly, uh, get deeper. And yeah, you know, frankly, no country was hurt more by the rise of China starting in the 1990s than Mexico. I mean, Mexico was poised to really uh, take off uh, after uh, you know uh, NAFTA entered into force in the early 1990s, and China got a lot of that. So again, I think this is an area where the U.S. and Mexico should be uh, really walking in lockstep. And I think there's a, a broad recognition on both sides of the border that, you know, we're on the same team now and, and China is, is a competitor and we got to work together. Thank you, Chris. Kate? Oh, back on. Well, China is a competitor and we should work together, but China is also an opportunity for Mexico to diversify its sources of investment. Uh, and I think that the nearshoring phenomenon could also take a form where Chinese investment, as we are starting to see, is really increasing into Mexico. Um, and as we have seen in Africa and other cases, um, this is something that I think the United States will find a difficult situation. 
um, that if the United States is seeing nearshoring taking place with Chinese companies locating uh, firms in Mexico and taking advantage of free trade rules under the USMCA, um, that that could be a, a situation in which the interests of Mexico and the United States would not converge. Could I hop in on that? Because I think that's really an excellent point that I've been trying to make recently. Uh, I actually took my first ride in a Chinese electric vehicle a few weeks ago when I was in Mexico City. I was surprised how many Chinese electric vehicles I saw there. And I know that this is just the beginning of a push. You know, I think Mexico has to be, frankly, extremely careful, given that uh, the USMCA or TEMEC is up for renewal in two years, uh, that there is not a perception that Kate just alluded to that China is using uh, the free trade agreement between the United States and Mexico as a backdoor to avoid the tariffs that were imposed by Trump and continued by Biden. I think the U.S. people who study the U.S.-Mexico relationship should not take for granted that USMCA will be rubber stamped and continued. And I think this, in my view, is a dagger at the heart of the USMCA. I think it would be very uh, challenging to make a case for renewal if there's the perception that China is taking advantage of this. So again, just a, a note of caution for people who, who care about this. Just to provide some numbers of what the ambassador said, uh, there are 15 new companies, Chinese companies in Mexico, selling their cars, and they are already, they have taken about 10% of the, the market share, and they are expecting to take some more, so 5% more, so 15 total. So that's the challenge that other firms in Mexico have vis-a-vis -vis the, the Chinese cars. So just uh, providing some numbers of what you said, Ambassador. Uh, we're talking about the, the U.S.-Mexico relation. Yesterday, uh, President Biden mentioned th 13 times her pre previous uh, predecessor or his predecessor and he without mentioning his name. But he didn't mention Mexico, but Mexico was in the room. When he talked about fentanyl, everybody thought about Mexico. When uh, he talked about a regular migration, everybody thought about Mexico, most probably. And when uh, he talked about the border, uh, Mexico was there. So what is, what would be the, the, the role of Mexico in the campaign, not the active role of, the, of my country, but you mean the, the, the concept of Mexico in the campaign, and uh, particularly in these uh, three topics, in, in fentanyl, in general in, in security issues, and uh, the border and the migration issues. What, what would be, do you think, the role that it will have and you think that both are going to be using or bashing against Mexico like uh, candidate Trump did uh, for a little bit more than four years ago? Let me jump in. Um, I think I think Trump will bash, will use, use it as a negative. I think Biden, first off, Mexico, as in all of the trade issues that we were just talking about, that's not going to be part of the discussion, I don't believe. Um, uh, I think on, on the Biden side, it will be more in terms of the, uh, what he's doing on immigration, how he, I mean, he really handed, you know, put the blame for the failure of the immigration compromise, um, on the Republican shoulders and he's going to use that. Um, and I think quite effectively, um, what's unfortunate, uh, at least from my perspective is that as we were talking about earlier, there is such an opportunity for uh, Mexico to develop and increase its middle class, the growth with this nearshoring and friendshoring. Um, and what I'm concerned about is that American companies, American investors are increasingly, I believe, concerned about security, safety, rule of law in Mexico um, that, uh, They'll look for other places to invest. And that is actually going to be very damaging for the long-term relationship because we, these two countries are inextricably tied, not just because we have a shared um, community, right? You know, 60 plus percent of, of the Hispanics in the United States have their origin from Mexico. So there's their deep connection. So I, I'm worried that the only time Mexico will come up will be drugs, fentanyl, and immigration. And the, the, the depth of the relationship uh, is not going to, to get the attention. Um, but I trust that if we have a Biden administration, that that 
that deeper relationship will will get attention. Is for example, what do you think about for example migration? Do you think that's going to be a, a subtle topic? Yeah, the, 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 in my view, there is no question that the border will be probably the most important issue in this election, if not, you know, along with the economy and and you know, maybe there'll be some other big international. Uh, it's clearly going to be one of the top three. Uh, and um, I think, though, we have to remember now that the border is not just a bilateral U.S.-Mexico issue anymore. The, the issues have changed dramatically really over the past 10 years or so that the, 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 the number of Mexicans are uh, often in the minority of people who are actually crossing the U.S.-Mexico border. So this is a global phenomenon and I think needs to be addressed by the United States globally and not as an issue just on the bilateral relationship with Mexico. Uh, I think, you know, obviously you, you see, and, and those of you in Mexico know this very well, you can look out the window and, and see who's you know, on the streets. I mean, there are millions of people from all over the world coming to Mexico in an attempt to come into the United States, right? Bangladesh, Congo, Venezuela, Cuba, Brazil, Ukraine, you name it. OK, it's like the United Nations there on the border. And so, you know, I don't think that this is a question about bashing Mexico. In fact, during the Trump administration, we actually had very good relations with Mexico on these issues, because I think Mexico realized this kind of uncontrolled migratory flow is not in Mexico's interest either. I think as ambassador, I certainly was trying to focus on win-win situations where it is in everybody's interest to get control of this and come up with legal and controlled frameworks as opposed to you know caravans and and all this stuff and i think president trump understands that i think he worked well with mexico my recent discussions in mexico uh lead me to believe there's a willingness in mexico to work with him should he be reelected so i think these these flows frankly and again, we we're, we come from different political views here on this call. That's great. That's the way it should be. But you know, in, in my view, this is the result of a few policy decisions by the Biden administration, and, and those can be changed. I think they should be changed. And I, I think this is a crisis that can be contained relatively quickly, and then we can start focusing on things like economic prosperity and security. Just Kathleen, before you 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 you, you got jump into this, but for the average American, I think this uh, sort of explanation that the ambassador gave us, and uh, which I understand and I agree with him that the border is not only U.S. Mexico but has other components coming in from Africa. But I don't think the average American understands that. I was uh, listening yesterday to Senator uh, uh, Katie Britt. From Alabama in, in, the, in responding to the, to the State of the Union address, and uh, pretty pretty much implied Mexico being responsible of what is happening in not only regular migration but security and flows of of, of drugs and all that. She talks about cartels. She talked about cartels. So I, I wonder if, if for the average American there is this uh, difference in 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 what in the role of Mexico because I don't think that's that's there, and and, and I think that Mexico is going to be sort of responsible or be assigned all the responsibilities. I don't know, Kathleen, what do you think? Well, I do uh, teach a class on U.S.-Mexican relations, and uh, my students don't know uh, that, that this is really no longer simply a Mexico phenomenon. Um, I think that Mexico has certainly an interest in working with whoever is elected uh, in the United States um, to stem the flow of migrants into Mexico. Uh, because if there is some version of a remain in Mexico policy um, and, a, or, and or a militarization of the border, which seems increasingly likely, regardless of who wins, I think that that has clear negative impacts on Mexico and that it will be in Mexico's interest uh, to try to work with the United States to stop people from getting into Mexico in the first place to in order to migrate to the north, because it, I think that there's a good chance, regardless of who is elected, that this will um, be a problem. But I don't think that the campaign will really expose the nuances of that situation. I think there's um, 
there was a famous saying when uh, Bill Clinton was running for office, it's the economy, stupid, right? You know, boil it down for the American voter into something simple. And I think that's likely to happen when it comes to the issue of immigration. Um, there are certainly many people who understand the nuances, but I don't think the average American voter does. Uh, and if you look, for example, at the Texas primary, which just happened on Tuesday, uh, in the counties along the border, Trump did much better than average and Biden did much worse than average, right? So Biden and Trump have both visited the Texas border recently, right? This is going to be an issue about the Mexican border and who's coming across the Mexican border. And the failures of the Biden administration are going to be highlighted as much as they can be by uh, the Trump campaign. So I think that there will be a simplification process in the process of the campaign, which is going to feel really ugly um, to a lot of people who care about the issue of immigration. Yeah. We have a couple of questions, uh, and uh, they are related one to each other. One is uh, asking, what will be the influence uh, advertently or inadvertently of uh, President López Obrador in the U.S. election. And the, other, and the second question has to do with what the, we will have a female president most likely in Mexico, uh, either Xochitl Galvez or Claudia Sheinbaum. Uh, what will be the relation with the, either one of them uh, with the Biden administration, the new Biden administration or a new Trump administration, if you care to, to, to think about this? You know, I, I, I'm biased only because Scheinbaum um, got her graduate degree from Berkeley. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but I think, uh, I don't imagine a real stark difference between either of them vis-a-vis -vis the United States because the set of issues remain the same, which is how to manage migration at the uh, U.S.-Mexico border, what to do about the cartels and fentanyl. And so... Um, I, I just said, it's exciting for me to think that Mexico will be, have a female president before the United States does. Um, but beyond that, I, I really, I think if it were Biden administration, I think there will be real opportunities to deal with some of the nuances that, that Kate was talking about. Um, I'm worried that if it's the Trump administration, um, I hope that it can be positive as, as Chris says from before, but uh, you know, pretty hard. I think that's a natural segue to me, Maria. <laughs> and and um, <laughs> I, I have said, uh, and, and I continue to say, there cannot be a healthy relationship between the US and Mexico as long as the border is in disarray. Right at bottom, our relation that border which unites us also divides us, and uh, we need to uh, get that under control. As long as we're again, we're spending this time talking about migration, fentanyl, as opposed to talking about positive things. I mean, as ambassador, I kept getting dragged into all of the you know what I call like the negative issues where you know it's just trying to stop a problem as opposed to focusing on the opportunity issues that I think offer so much for both sides where there's all these win-win solutions. Uh, you know, I will say, you, you mentioned AMLO, and, you know, I, I think the, the, the predictions were, of course, you know, that when AMLO came in, that, oh, he and Trump would be like this, and U.S.-Mexico relations would be a disaster. You know, that didn't happen, okay? I was ambassador there. Like, I know this firsthand as well as anybody. And, and, and those of you on this call, you know, who were observers of the relationship could see uh, that, you know, AMLO and Trump got along fine. They focused on areas in which they agreed. And, you know, both of them are kind of uh, anti-establishment insurgents within their political environments and actually found a lot of common ground and mutual respect. That's why, you know, the U.S.-Mexico relationship under Trump, notwithstanding all of the naysayers, was actually, you know, I think a a, a positive one where we focused, we, we you know, we got the, the 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 trade agreement updated and and renegotiated. Uh, you know, there was unprecedented cooperation on the border for the first time. Mexico itself was enforcing its own migration laws. 
Uh, and you know, Trump recognizes that. So I think President Trump sees Mexico as someone who he can cut a deal with. And and that's what he did the last time. So, you know, I, again, I, I think, you know, the fentanyl issues, I, I think, are going to require a lot of introspection on both sides of the border. We are in a very long standing pattern of pointing the finger at each other and just saying it's your fault. No, it's your fault. And meanwhile, the bad guys are are getting away with literally murder. So, you know, I, I've expressed my own views on that. I think that's going to call for a major change, frankly, in the way the U.S. government and bureaucracy approach the problem, uh, which has long been focused on we got to catch the bad guys in Mexico and extradite them to the United States. I mean, as ambassador, that was 95% of what we were doing in our cooperation with Mexico on fentanyl. I thought that was absurd. Like, I think we should be working with Mexico on port security, on regulation of fentanyl and precursors. And th th there's a lot of positive ways to move this. But if you let the forces of inertia that have not solved the problem for 40 years continue, we, we will not obviously get a better solution. So and I, I don't think that is a political issue. Hopefully, I don't suspect there's going to be disagreement on that. But that, for me, was a big challenge just with the bureaucratic forces within the U.S. government, frankly. And for, and there are corresponding ones in Mexico that are I would rather, again, blame the other side than actually do something. Thank you. Kathleen, you want to comment? And you think the gender yeah. issue would be, would be something to watch? Because a, a former President Trump has kind of a record of of uh, having you know some gender issues, so I wonder if that would be something that could be significant uh, if she if he wins and having either Xochitl or Claudia on the other side of the table. And well, let, let me sorry, Kate, let, sorry for interrupting, but let me emphasize this because today is the International uh, Women's Day. Uh, this is, a, and it, I mean, uh, there's going to be huge marches in Mexico City, and uh, and we know that. Uh, I mean, it's uh, the relationship between uh, Donald Trump and women has not been the best of the world, as as with AMLO, the same. So let me press you a little bit of that. I mean, how will that mean a a, a female president in Mexico dealing, let's say, with Trump. Uh, so, Kate, to you. Well, if I may put on my hat as a scholar of the Mexican left, I remember when AMLO was elected, there were, um, I was interviewed a number of times about, you know, well, what's he going to do? Is he going, is he crazy? And I'm like, no, he's, he's pragmatic. He's going to figure out a way to get along with Trump. And that's exactly what happened. And I think the same thing will happen regardless of whether it's Claudia or Sochi who's elected. I think they're going to figure out a way to get along with whoever is elected in the United States. Um, do I think that the gender of the of the president of Mexico is going to have uh, an effect? I kind of do. Uh, I I just think that. Uh, there is a, a tendency for some people to think they can push around a woman faster than they can push around a man. But I also think that both Claudia and Sochi are tough as nails, and they're going to uh, be in a position to say no. Um, I, I think that it's probably worth mentioning that um, the election day of the United States is in November. And the inauguration day of the Mexican president this year is going to be in October. So before the election, Mexico will already have a new president. And I think that we will be able to see to some extent how the candidates deal with that in their um, the, the last month of the campaign and what's going to happen. It will be a challenge for whoever the new president is in Mexico to try to um, navigate that period of time when Mexico will be... Um, <laughs> most likely vilified um, as the campaign winds down. Thank you, Kate. Uh, uh, Chris, uh, you obviously are, uh, and it's evident in your responses, a, a, a professional, a, a top lawyer in the US. You were a clerk at the Supreme Court and, and your Spanish is impeccable. Uh, your, dad yes. a your dad was a diplomat. So I mean, you really did a beautiful job, I, I would say so, uh, for US-Mexican relations. You were working for the US. I'm a little worried uh, about Trump 2.0. I mean, there's some analysis out there saying that Trump will be more radical, that he will appoint only loyal people. So 
as someone who worked for Trump, but, but above all, I mean, you're a, a very sophisticated policymaker and diplomat. Would you say that Trump will radicalize or, will be, or, or, or what to expect? And uh, uh, yes. President Trump has always seem to uh, conjure up the, 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 these horrible uh, images in the minds of his opponents. I mean, again, he, he has now been president. He was president for four years. So we, we know that. Um, I was proud to be part of that administration. And uh, I think we got a lot done, notwithstanding everybody, you know, uh, who was opposed to President Trump saying, oh, my God, he's going to be terrible. They're now starting like, oh, my gosh, well, he was maybe not have been terrible the first time, but he certainly will be terrible the second time. You know, again, I I think that's politics, right? People are going to say that. Um, you know, I, I I think, frankly, President Trump is a deal maker. I do not see him wanting to vilify Mexico. I see him uh, approaching Mexico in this campaign as saying, you know, something. I actually got a deal done with Mexico the last time, and we worked together again. And if I'm president uh, again, we will work with Mexico. Uh, just as closely, we'll cut a deal with Mexico. And so, again, I, I don't, uh, you know, I don't buy into all the doom and gloom. Again, we, we, we've already seen that movie, right? It, it you know, again, polit politics is going to be what it is. I, I just think there is always a narrative on President Trump that, uh, you know, he's some kind of, uh, you know, particular monster uh that 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 is uniquely dangerous okay like that's the political narrative like i i understand that uh but you know to me that's all it is and you know like uh, again I, I i i think frankly there's a lot of opportunities in the u.s mexico relationship i i don't think anybody can look at the u.s mexico relationship these last four years with biden and say oh my gosh things are just going terrific like this is this is great i i, I think Again, th th this is, you know, particularly from my perspective, it's been very painful for me to see a lot of the policies that we put into place immediately reversed on day one. I could have told you we were going to have all this crisis at the border. This was totally, totally obvious to me. OK, like and this is not helpful to Mexico. OK, so I think hopefully there's people in Mexico who are sophisticated enough not to fall for the same old line of, oh, my God, Trump's a monster and he's going to be your worst enemy. He's the, the monster hiding under your bed. So be very careful. You know, again, I, I, I read articles like that. I get it. But, you know, again, I, I, I don't buy that. Maria. I, I just want to say I agree with Chris vis-a-vis -vis Mexico. Whether it's Biden or Trump, it's not going to be the world falling in. However, it's like the tail of the dog. For the United States as a country, the chaos, the breaking of norms, the plans that are, this is an existential election for the United States. And just want to remind, just like, really? We had President Trump when the pandemic hit. There are many, many questions that arose for how that was handled, the lives that were lost. The So yes, from the Mexico, we're here at a US-Mexico, uh, probably from Mexico's perspective, the, the challenge, there's opportunities. But from what is going to happen in the United States, that is the subject probably of another forum. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Maria and I can uh, debate that separately. We, we, exactly. we can talk about the, the all the criminal <laughs> indictments against President Trump, the attempt to put him in jail, whatever. We we can we, we can discuss that. That's that's well, that's what democracy. Uh, and certainly, there's two lawyers here. Uh, both lawyers. <laughs> we can't help it. We're just we're trained. We're programmed to argue. It's in our DNA. <laughs> well, and there are only ninety accounts, so I mean that will be a lot of to discuss. Kathleen. <laughs> Well, academics are trained to say on the one hand, on the other hand, <laughs> uh, uh, without getting into what uh, Trump would do to the United States. Um, I do think that uh, that the issue of immigration in the campaign is going to be different than the issue of immigration in a Trump or Biden presidency. Um, I think that there are 
good reasons for the U.S. and Mexico to try to work together because, as we've already mentioned, the problem of immigration is no longer a simply a Mexico-U.S. problem, um, if it ever really was. Um, and I also wonder whether the the issue of drugs will become more important in the campaign. And I say this because of where the swing states are, um, swing states that Biden won last time, like Michigan or Wisconsin or Pennsylvania. Um, these are areas where there's not a whole lot of concern about immigration, but there is concern about fentanyl. Uh, and so I, I do wonder whether that might not prove to be an advantageous hook um, for the candidates to start talk to try to talk about well, what are we going to do? Uh, what are you going to do about fentanyl? What are if if this becomes an issue, then I think that Mexico um, would again become part of the conversation. Unfortunately, not in terms of what fentanyl and the drug trafficking are doing to Mexico, uh, which I think is is an equally important aspect of the problem, if not more important. Um, but in terms of how do we stop the flow of drugs from Mexico to the United States? And again, there's a, you know, what is the, what is the obvious solution? Um, it's again, the border. And I think uh, Ambassador Landau is right about that, that the border is, is linked in trade and immigration and in drugs. But I have one point just since we're, I'm sorry, Maria, we, we want to, you, you go first, you go first. No, no, you first. Okay, I just want to say one thing. So we're talking about the, I asked before this webinar, who is the audience here? And I think uh, Rafael said a lot of people who live on the border. And one of the things that surprised me as ambassador was that people who actually live in these border communities in the San Diego area, Arizona, Texas, aren't more active in American politics in really bringing up how the, the, these kind of nuts and bolts at the border affect their lives. I mean, I was there when the pandemic started and we we, we shut the border to non-essential traffic, which meant you couldn't go visit your abuela who lived on the other side of the border. You couldn't go to your dentist's appointment, maybe. Like it disrupted lives of people at the border in myriad ways that I was completely aware of Again, we're talking now March 2020 when nobody really knew what was going on. I thought this might be a matter of a couple of weeks or months. We all did. Remember, like two weeks to stop the spread. I was shocked. I wanted to, you know, starting already by the summer, I said, like, why aren't we reopening the border? There are health measures in place in terms of at least allowing people with family on their side of the border to cross, you know. What I was basically, you know, the, the bureaucracy didn't want to do that for a variety of reasons. And frankly, it was not reopened fully until almost a year into the Biden administration in, in 2021. And I would just urge our listeners who are in border communities, please make your views known to your senator, representatives, to people in Washington, because you have a unique experience living on the border that policymakers in Mexico City or Washington do not have. And I felt like I couldn't want it more than you. Like if, if you were not clamoring and calling your representatives every day, what, from my point in Mexico City, it was hard for me to basically be putting my hair on fire saying we've got to be changing things at the border. So again, this is, I hope a nonpartisan, non-political issue, just make your voices heard in the political process because you have a very unique perspective on US-Mexico relations. Uh, and I think it's a very important one. Thank you, Grace. I just wanted to actually pick up on that point of um, Kate had mentioned the Latino vote and the counties in, along the border that um, Trump has, um, there's more support for. The trick, uh, whether it's migration or drugs, is for the Biden campaign not, I think they finally understand that the Latino community is not monolithic mm -hmm. and that in fact, it is a swing voter. It is not part of the democratic base the way the African-American vote is, uh, but, but the knee jerk reaction is to try to treat it as the base and to talk about immigration in a way as if that's the only thing that Latinos care about and that is not true. So I think that, there is an opportunity to um, tease out those nuances. And I really, really agree that 
communities along the border need need to tell their elected officials what they are experiencing and how they want government to respond because these issues are extremely they're affecting their lives right but last on the migration thing i want to it won't happen in the campaign but i want to be clear our audience migration is a world global issue and it's not going away with climate change with everything that is going on and as Doris Meisner once said, you cannot control immigration. All you can do is manage it. Right. Manage it because human beings, a big chunk of them, will pick up and leave to look for a better life. So we, to manage the U.S.-Mexico border, we collectively have to find ways to really ensure opportunity and development in the sending countries. This this is not going to go away, notwithstanding the politicians who say, I fix it like this with this one regulation. We have well, five minutes left. So I will ask you if you can use one minute. I know it's hard for lawyers to speak for one minute, but if you can do it in one minute, just a conclusion uh, on this. And perhaps if you can- Academics too, you got to give me 55 minutes for a lecture. <laughs> <laughs> But, but before, I, I mean, point for a lecture, but well, in one minute or one and a half, if you can uh, provide uh, some uh, conclusions and some recommendations, I think it's, if, if you were a Mexican official, what would you do vis-a-vis, uh, uh, -be, let's say, a bashing of Mexico in the campaign? Is there a role that the government, Mexican government can do or Mexican acad academics or what would be your conclusion? Uh, and Chris, a, a question for you, because I believe it's, it's very much in the minds of a lot of Mexicans and it's there. It, uh, it's uh, it's asking, do you think that Trump could uh, military intervene in Mexico? He has said so, and it's just uh, a direct question to you. But let's let's uh, if you if you want to start answering that and then do your conclusions, please. The short answer, sorry, I, the short answer to that specific question is no. Uh, I, I well, I certainly believe that it would be extremely unwise to me. The calls for that are an outgrowth of the the very militarized thinking about the counter narcotic strategy in general. Uh, you know, the DEA driven. We've got to catch the bad guys and extradite them. Okay, the Mexicans aren't catching the bad guys, so now we have to catch the bad guys in Mexico and extradite them. I just think that's fundamentally a losing strategy. I think anybody who studied the issue, in my experience, also thinks that's a losing strategy, that you cut the head off the snake, the snake has five heads, right? I mean, a chop was sitting there in prison, but the Sinaloa cartel is still alive and kicking. So I have my issues, as you can tell, with the American approach to this. And frankly, I think anything like that would make the situation far worse. Uh, and I think you know, the, President Trump understands that. Uh, but I think there's a, there's a frustration in Washington. And this goes back to some of the, the issues we've been discussing that, you know, Mexico has, you know, whether it's fair or not, that, that on migration and on drugs, that, you know, Mexico is not doing everything that Mexico needs to do. Again, I, I think we can work with Mexico on these issues. I think we, we need to kind of come up with fresh thinking about how to handle some of these uh, issues. But but I think, you know, the, 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 the opportunities are there. And, and I think I thought Maria made a, a very good point and, and Kate as well. Like the, 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 the Latino vote in the United States is a critical vote and it's a vote that is up for grabs and i think that is actually super valuable and helpful to the latino community in the united states because a vote that is up for grabs is a vote that's going to get a lot of attention from politicians nobody's taking that vote for granted and you know again i, I do not people your question kind of started with you know bashing mexico i personally i'm not involved with the campaign so i can't say what the campaign is going to do but i would be very doubtful that there is going to be this bashing campaign because I think, for me, President Trump can actually say, I got the deal done with Mexico and it was Biden who undid 
the things that we had done to get control of the situation. And, and I want to go back to what I had done and work with the colleagues in Mexico. I mean, let's not forget AMLO's uh, first foreign trip as president was to the White House under President Trump in July of 2020. So he and Trump, you know, can get a deal. And I suspect that is true with with him and, and, and Claudia. And I think that's the way he's going to be thinking about that campaign in a second term. Sorry, I think I went way over. I apologize. Yes, yes, indeed. <laughs> Maria, please. Uh, let me say that I think that if I were a Mexican elected official, if I were, I, I would really be taking a hard look. Like Mexico is has so many resources. It has a, a population. It's it focusing on its internal development. We, it has a, now under Previous presidents tried one way to deal with the drugs, cartels tried another way. What is the internal strategy for really tackling that? And what does it need from the US to be effective, right? So that would be my number one, because without that sense of security, which is permeating the countryside, um, I can tell you from my own little village where we have property, the word on the street is the narcos have moved in, but it's okay because their families live here, so nothing's going to happen here. This is horrible. How can so that would be my number one? What is it that you are doing in your country to make it the kind of robust society that can be a true partner with the U.S. and not be the um, the focus of the bashing. That would be my number one. What can you in Mexico do to be that partner that, and then I'll, those of us in the States like me will focus on educating our American people that Mexico is an ally and a friend for the future and that together we can actually have a very um, positive future. Thank you, Maria. Kathleen, please. I'll try to be very brief. I would simply say to a Mexican official that um, the Mexican president will be decided uh, before the U.S. president is decided. And whoever is elected, their best option is to continue to make contacts, not only with the presidential campaigns of both candidates, but with those who will remain in office regardless of who wins the presidency, with governors, uh, with mayors along the border, um, because a lot of policy gets made at the local level, not just the national level. And so I, I think that uh, there is more con there will be more continuity, despite the fact that the presidential election is, of course, very consequential, and that the that Mexican officials need to make sure that they're maintaining those contacts within the bureaucracy, within the local governments, and within the states. Thank you very much. I think it has been a fascinating discussion and hearing from you. I mean, we have learned a lot. And I think the very first lesson is that this is going to be a very different campaign. And so we have to, to learn how these two parties who have changed quite a bit. We're also sort of mimic into this campaign. So Rafa, thank you very much, Maria, Chris, and Kathleen, and Rafa. For your thank point. you all. It went beautiful. And of course, the only thing we need is more time with that uh, uh, we'll have you guys back, and, and thanks, uh, thanks a, a lot for for participating of, uh, and for being so candid in your views. Thank you very much. Bye.